All right, in Psalm 72, I occasionally will, will um, mention the titles that are given to some of these psalms as I, as I preach through the psalms here, and uh, tonight we're going to do that. Uh, it seems to be a, a fitting, a very fitting title for this psalm as it stands, and if you don't have it already in your Bible, the, the title for this psalm is given a psalm for Solomon. And we know at the very end, it's very apparent that this is a psalm of David because that last verse there, it says, the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. And it makes a lot of sense. And, and as we get into this, I'm, I'm subtitling this uh, a psalm for Solomon too because um, the content really fits very well for a future king. And I also just want to point out, I think it's really interesting that one, we all know a psalm is a song, right? But that last verse says the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended within this song. So um, obviously there's a lot of praise involved in song, but it's not just praise. There's also doctrine and there's also even prayer being made through song and prayer is just asking it's a request so as this is a psalm for solomon there's a lot of requests being made unto the lord in addition to praising the lord and other things we'll find within this but if we look at verse number one we see the request right at the beginning in this psalm the bible says give the king thy judgments O god and thy righteousness unto the king's son and what we're going to see, there's a lot of, of symbolism here, uh, especially just references to, I think, even more importantly, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that becomes more apparent as we get into the meat of this psalm particularly, that it really does reference and is talking about Jesus. But the Word of God is so amazing that as David is being moved by the Holy Ghost to, to make this psalm, you know, he's making this psalm for his son, but it's the word of God also. So he has his son in mind, but it also makes sense that he is, you know, telling his son about Christ and about the true king to come. You know, the prince of princes, the king of kings, lord of lords, and um, giving that information and talking about the king to come for a king that is rising to sit on the seat and rule a kingdom is wise advice also and 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 um i think very appropriate now so it says give the king thy judgments O god and thy righteousness unto the king's son and this is extremely important and i'm not going to go through all of the proverbs where we see solomon did receive this great wisdom of judgment and justice that was given to him. We'll actually look at that story in a little bit, uh, how God answers his prayer and gives him these things. And this, is, this starts with a request from David for Solomon to have these things. And I think that's important to note, right? So by the time Solomon is an older man and is coming into his own, and, and when I say older man, he's not like really young, right? But when he takes over the kingdom, He's a man. He's 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 not he's not like some of the kings that are eight or twelve or even like eighteen or twenty. He's a little bit older than that as he takes over the kingdom from his father. He's established as an adult man, but he has that desire and that want to do right and to be able to know how to judge and to be able to have the wisdom and the knowledge that's necessary to do the good job. And I believe that that was given to him that desire was was supported and helped and promoted through king david and we see david's desire for solomon to have these attributes and for god to help him and to give him that righteousness and that judgment before david even dies so you know you as as parents especially you know you want your children to grow up and be great and have a very uh, you know have a lot of integrity and be moral people and people who are wise and know the righteousness and judgment of god to be able to carry that and continue that forward right and we ought to be striving to instill that in our children and that's going to require you as a parent to one show the good example in your own life 
but then two, don't forsake or don't ignore and spend the time necessary to train and to raise up and to, and to teach and to, to take advantage of every opportunity that you have, like Deuteronomy chapter 6 teaches of you know, when, you're, when you uh, lay down to sleep, when you rise up, when you're walking by the way, those are all examples of times when you ought to be diligently teaching your children and instructing them in the righteousness of God, in the law of God, and to, to you know, allow them to have this heart. And in addition to that, praying unto God, right? Like David here is just praying, hey, God, give the king thy judgment, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge thy people with righteousness, and thy poor with judgment. And the poor and needy come up quite a bit in this passage too. I just want to make a note of that now before we continue. Uh, I'll go into a little bit deeper in just a minute. Verse 3, the mountains shall bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. That's an interesting verse. I th what I believe this is teaching here is that the mountains is symbolic of people who have been lifted up are bringing peace to the people, the common people, it says, and the little hills by righteousness. So by those that are not as exalted or lifted up in general just in society, but bringing peace through righteousness or by righteousness to all the people. It's part of being a good ruler um, to be able to bring peace to the people. Verse number four, he shall judge the poor of the people he shall save the children of the needy. And there, again, there's another reference. Like I said, this continues throughout this psalm, this reference to the poor and needy. And it's, and it's no shock. We've seen this already through m many of the psalms. There is a special place in God's heart, and God is a God of justice and judgment, and he cares a lot for the poor and needy, for the fatherless and the widows, for the people who aren't able to defend themselves. God loves those people. And, um, it, you know, in order for justice to really shine through, God cares for those people. And I, and I love how the, the rest of this verse goes as well. He says, look, he shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy and shall break in pieces the oppressor. This is something that's missing from judgment or kings or rulers or presidents or whatever in today's society. Because if you're going to stand there and say, look, I love the poor, and I love the children of the needy, and I love these people who don't have anything. Instead of, like, the, the way that they, they'll try to show that, they'll tell you, say, oh, well, the government's just going to give them a bunch of money. Right? That's how we love you. We're just going to get you dependent on government, and we'll solve all of your problems. Well, you know, these people who are actually working and doing all this other stuff, we're just going to take their money, and we're going to give it to you. Look, that's not the love that they need. What they, what they really need is just justice. What they need is people not uh, getting away with committing crimes against them, with stealing from them, with keeping them under bondage, keeping them in usury, you know, having all these bad practice, criminal, criminal practices against these people who don't have much and not able to, to defend themselves and speak for themselves. But the people who are in a rule and judge the poor and save the children of the needy, you know what needs to happen? They need to break in pieces the oppressor. The poor and the needy aren't going to have any problems if you don't have the oppressor there oppressing them. So the oppressor needs to be destroyed. The oppressor needs to be broken in pieces. The oppressor needs to have the, the, the harsh or severe judgment, but the judgment of God, right? And I call it harsh or severe because compared to what we see today, you know, they're, they're not being judged appropriately, but they need to have this, uh, this mindset and, and, a, and, a, and a righteous king and someone's going to have righteous judgments that's being requested here is going to be someone that will break in pieces the oppressor. So when they see the poor, they see the children of the needy, they want to help them, they care about them, they're interested in helping them, but the oppressor needs to be broken down. And when you have corruption in government, the oppressors get a free pass. And, and this happens, it's disgusting how much this happens just in general. You hear about the cases of even, even to the point of judges being bought off and uh, you know, like juvenile uh, detention centers getting children because they get more tax money and judges being harsher on their sentences and p punishing the kids. But the real oppressors are the ones in those facilities, right? And, then, and I mean, there's so many examples of this. I could just go on and on literally probably all night of the poor and the children of the needy that are being oppressed
by the people who are able to line the pockets of the politicians and get away with all of their crimes. Which, if we had a godly ruler, someone would step in and be like, no, these oppressors, they're being broken to pieces. Verse 5, they shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass as showers that water the earth. In his days shall the righteous flourish an abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. And we're, we're, if you haven't noticed already, I think even in the language is starting to tell us this is not just talking about some regular human king on this earth. We're seeing a little bit more when it's talking about, you know, essentially for all time is, is, is how it's being expressed here as long as the sun's around and um, as long as the moon endureth. There's this abundance of peace. Uh, righteous are flourishing in the days of this king. Verse 8, he shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. And this also did not happen. Israel did, was not a, a worldwide kingdom. It was not, they did not have rule over everybody ever. They had limits and boundaries even at their, at their most powerful or most influential during the reign of Solomon, by the way, where they, where they were at their height, they were at their peak spiritually, physically, everything, right? Because it was after that that the, uh, the kingdom was divided. When, when Solomon's son Rehoboam took over, that's when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and, and Rehoboam split, you know, the, the kingdom was split and was split ever since then. So, and we're going to see some of the, the similarities with the reign of Solomon with the kingdom to come on this earth. But, Let's keep reading through this. We're starting to see some of the language now supporting, wait, maybe we're not just talking about Solomon here. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him and his enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the isle shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Now, this is a verse here that we actually do see being uh, played out with Solomon literally. And like I said, with a lot of these, you, we get some back and forth between the, 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 the current or the short-term prophecy as well as long-term prophecies, and they often will overlap as well. So we know that when Jesus Christ sets up his kingdoms, that all the nations of the earth are going to flow unto him, and they're going to flow unto Jerusalem, and they're going to seek the word of God, and they're, you know, like that he's going to get respect from all the nations, and he is going to be in charge. He's going to rule with a rod of iron, and it's going to be just the way it is. So we know that for a fact in time to come. But let's keep your place here in Psalm 72 and flip back to 2 Chronicles chapter number 9. 2 Chronicles chapter number 9. And we're not going to read the whole chapter, but I'll just skip and hit a few highlights of this chapter. Um, there's multiple chapters in 2 Chronicles here that just really go in depth about the reign of King Solomon. Because like I said, it is a very important reign, and I believe it is a type of the heavenly kingdom that's going to come to this earth when Jesus Christ rules and reigns. It's a, it's a foreshadowing of that. There's a lot of symbolism pointing to that. And, uh, you know, Solomon is a type of Christ in that, during his reign. He, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that are, are very similar um, to the reign of Christ on this earth that already existed in Israel in Solomon's reign. Uh, look at verse number one. The Bible reads, And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to prove Solomon with hard questions at Jerusalem with a very great company and camels that bear spices and gold in abundance and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And she talks to him, and he's, she's blown away at how, like, 
everyone loves serving Solomon. All the servants are in order. They're doing right. They're happy. You know, things are going just really well in the kingdom. And she's just like, I didn't hear the half of it. But then jump down to verse number nine. It says, and she gave the king 120 talents of gold and of spices great abundance and precious stones. Neither was there any such spice as the queen of Sheba gave King Solomon. So she's blessing him with all of these gifts. Well, Psalm 72 10 said the kings of Tarshish and of the isle shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. So we see a lot of gifts being offered here to King Solomon, right, by the queen of Sheba. That's literally mentioned in Psalm 72, which, by the way, Psalm 72 was penned down before Solomon was made king. Because Solomon wasn't king until King David was, like, dead, practically, right? Like, like he's, like, on his deathbed. He can't even keep warm. And he's finally ordaining Solomon to become the next king. Right, so that's when he steps in and becomes king. And then, of course, these events don't happen until it takes seven years. They're building this house. They're building the house of the Lord. They're doing all this other work before this event even takes place. So this is well after the, uh, the psalm is recorded as the word of God, but demonstrates it's the word of God, right? I mean, it's just showing that this stuff is, I mean, he's literally naming the kings that are going to come, and they come, of course, foreshadowing the reign of Jesus Christ as well, but in the short term, even to his son Solomon, that this psalm for Solomon uh, was a blessing for Solomon and uh, was, was showed to become true. Jump down to verse number 14 there in 2 Chronicles chapter 9. The Bible says, Beside that which Chapman and merchant, merchants brought, and all the kings of Arabia and governors of the country brought gold and silver to Solomon. So just further illustrating that many kings are bringing gifts. So this, this reign of King Solomon, I mean, he's, he's looked up to and revered, and people probably have a fear of King Solomon at this point, which is why they're bringing gifts. I mean, they're not just bringing gifts for no reason. They want to be on Solomon's good side, right? They, could, they recognize the power of the nation of Israel. They recognize the wisdom that he has and the might that he has. And people start to fear, which, by the way, are godly attributes, right? The all, that obviously, Solomon's not almighty, but, but people will have the fear of God when they start to respect the power of God. When they start to see the wisdom and the power of the Lord, God Almighty, and the more you think about it, the more you start thinking, like, man, I better watch myself, right? And as Solomon is, is possessing some of these traits in the physical sense on this earth and, and has been, of course, blessed by God with all of this wisdom, and the people are working for him, and they're just doing these great works, I mean, because of all this wisdom that God gave him, he's able to manage all this stuff, and people are working for him. He knows how to keep the people happy. People are just investing time, energy, resources, and they're succeeding. And they're having these great works done, and this great temple, and, and there's this great unity within the whole nation, and everyone's happy and serving God and doing what's right and really seeing what it's like. And even as we get, uh, I, I don't know if I have this verse. In, yeah, it is. The next verse, verse number 20. And all the drinking vessels of King Solomon were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. So not just the temple, but, I mean, this is the house of the forest of Lebanon. Like just another house, just a completely different thing. The vessels, all the vessels, the plates, the, 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 the bowls, the, the cups, right? It's just a pure gold. None were of silver. And silver is also a precious metal. But he's like, it's like none of them are even silver. You know your silverware? Yeah, he didn't have silverware. He had goldware. <laughs> and it was not anything accounted of in the days of Solomon. And how does this foreshadow the kingdom to come? Well, you know, the new Jerusalem, the streets are paved with gold, Amen. right? The great pearly gates, very ornate, very beautiful, but there's so much of that gold. I mean, you're literally just going to be walking on gold, Amen. and that's how much there is that it, it's not even a thing. Like, it's not even a thing to covet. It's beautiful, but it's not even anything like, oh, yeah, of course, there's just gold everywhere. And that's the way it was here in Solomon's kingdom. So it's a lot of wealth. It's just, it's just showing, great, this is, this is just the way the kingdom is run. And no one even really thinks about it. Like, of course, 
just like today, you know, we have, we have a lot, live with a lot of wealth and a lot of people just have luxury items and things that you just take for granted, right? It's just like, well, yeah, of course. Of course I have air conditioning, right? I mean, yeah, it's a little hot outside, boop. And now, and now it's like, even here, you know, in the building that we meet in, I could just get on this thing and be like, yeah, let's turn that down a little bit, make it a little bit cooler. And, it, and it's not that much of a thought. Well, that's how gold was in Israel during the reign of Solomon. And just be that availability and just, sure, yeah, why not, right? For the king's ships went to Tarshish with the servants of Hiram. Every three years, once came the ships of Tarshish, bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. And King Solomon passed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. And all the, king, all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom that God had put in his heart. All the kings. Now, they weren't all under his authority, right? They, his realm didn't just spread to all the kings of the earth. But they did all know about him. They heard about him. And they wanted to hear from him. And they wanted to hear his wisdom. And they wanted to be near him and wanted to be by him and respected him. Right? Now, obviously, the difference is when Jesus Christ is of his kingdom, everyone will be under authority to him. But you see these similarities again in this foreshadowing of the kingdom to come. Verse 24, and they brought every man his present, vessels of silver and vessels of gold and raiment, harness and spices, horses and mules, a rate year by year. You know, the Bible also teaches that all the, the gold and the things that the heathen produce will ultimately be given to the children of God. Like they, they work and then, you know, the, the children of God will inherit those things. And we see this happening here as they're bringing in all of these gifts. That's why there's so much gold to put everywhere because so many people are just bringing it in unto Solomon, into Israel, and it's theirs. So um, anyhow, there's a lot here. Turn if you would to Isaiah chapter 60. I'm going to read the next verse in Psalm 72. Verse 11 says, Yea, all kings shall fall down before him, all nations shall serve him. Right, and we just got done reading that in Second Chronicles chapter nine. Isaiah chapter sixty. And here we're gonna see more of the um, the foreshadowing here that's also referenced in Psalm seventy two, but for Christ's kingdom, not for Solomon's, right? Because of course Isaiah is after, well, after the reign of Solomon. But Isaiah has a lot of prophecies about the kingdom to come. Look at verse number one. The Bible reads, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about and see. All they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Thy sons shall come from, afar, from far, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. The multitude of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all they from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. And the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with acceptance on mine altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. Who are these that fly as a cloud and as the doves to their windows? Surely the isles shall wait for me and the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from far their silver and their gold with them unto the name of the Lord thy God and to the Holy One of Israel because he hath glorified thee. And the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls and their kings shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor have I had mercy on thee. Therefore thy gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night, that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought. 
For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish, yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. Very prophetic passage. This did not come to pass. This is talking about Jerusalem. And it's talking about Jerusalem's gates. And Jerusalem's going to be ruling over all these <coughs> kings. And he's saying the strangers and the Gentiles and all these people are going to come in. And they're going to build up your place. And they're going to bring in their gifts. And he mention, mentions Sheba. And he mentions, mentions Tarshish. And he mentions the same places that are mentioned also in Psalm 72. So we saw the foreshadowing with Solomon. But then we also have the other event that's still yet to happen when all these people are coming and those that don't come and those that don't serve are shall perish the Bible says that hasn't happened when has that ever happened to Jerusalem after all of these events I mean after their captivity into Babylon like that that's never happened they've ne Israel's never been the same after their captivity into Babylon and these preachings of, of Isaiah happened shortly before they were taken over, and they never had this great realm as they did under King Solomon. Like, that was their greatest point, was under King Solomon. It's never come back to that point. So, obviously, this must be prophetic and speaking of the future, which we know. Uh, let's go back to Psalm 72. Verse 12, for he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also and him that hath no helper. Remember, th this theme keeps coming up with the poor and the needy. He shall spare the poor and needy and shall save the souls of the needy. Being a deliverer, being the righteous king. And this is why, you know, I think this is also why a lot of people who are poor, when we go and preach the gospel to them, they're, they're humble. But they accept God, they accept Christ, because God is a God that's there for the poor and needy. I mean, he's there for everyone, but he's definitely a God to bring justice and judgment to the poor and needy. And, and people in that condition, it, it kind of boggles my mind that they wouldn't seek unto the Lord. I mean, you got no one else helping you seek God. And just to illustrate this point for you, I'm going to kind of rapid fire through a few verses. I could, there's a lot in the scripture, but I just want to show you how much the Bible references the poor and needy and that special place that God has. So I'm going to read just a few passages for you from the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 15, 11, the Bible says, For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor and to thy needy in thy land. That's in the law of God, commanding people to say, hey, look, the poor are never going to be gone, so open up you know, uh, your hand wide to your brother, to the poor, and to the needy in your land. Take care of them. Deuteronomy 24, 14 says, Thou shalt not oppress an hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be of thy brethren or of thy strangers that are in thy land within thy gates. He's saying, I don't care, you know, the poor and the needy, you don't have any business oppressing them. Don't do it. Again, part of God's law, that God's instituted it, that you don't oppress the poor and the needy. Psalm 9, 18, for the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Because unfortunately, that's the way things do work in the dog-eat-dog -dog world. In, in, the, in the harsh world where the poor and the needy don't have the voice, it seems like they're just forgotten. They're just going to perish. They're just going to die. People don't even want to look at the poor and the needy. But God's like, no, you need to help them. No, I hear their cry. No, I will bring justice and judgment. I am the God of the poor and needy. Verse, uh, Psalm 12, verse 5 says, For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. Psalm 35, 10, All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee which delivereth the poor from him that is too strong for him? Yea, the poor and the needy from him that spoileth him. In Psalm 37, 14, The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow 
to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation. That is what the wicked do. The wicked in their wickedness, when they know they've got someone who is, a, it's a lot harder for them to fight back, that's who they abuse. That's who they go after. It's the easy ones that, that aren't able to fight back against them. That's why you know, the, the rich people aren't trying to steal from other rich people. You'd think that that would make more sense because they have a lot more money. But if you steal a little bit from a lot more people, you still get a lot of money. And if they can't fight you back, then you've got, you, there's, there's less risk involved when you just think about it from a wicked person's mindset. Right? Oh, I could squash this person. What are they going to do? Sue me? Huh. I've got the best lawyer's money can buy, and it's not going to hurt me any. They'll get destroyed trying to find a lawyer that's going to defend them. And my lawyers will just eat them up and spit them out in our, in our corrupt legal system. And that's what happens, right? And that's the way the world, you know what? That's been the way of the world going back as far as time. That's the way of the world, but it's not the way of God. God is great. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 31. We'll see in Psalm, or excuse me, not Psalm 31, Proverbs. Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31 is a great proverb that uh, it, it talks about the virtuous woman, but it also begins that proverb um, with a lesson from a virtuous woman unto Lemuel, which is a king. These are the teachings to King Lemuel on how to rule and how to reign and how to be virtuous and, and, and how he ought to be living his life. And, and, and to have good, proper judgment, this wisdom is imparted unto King Lemuel. Look at verse number 8. The Bible reads, Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. And then this is, so this is being taught from the perspective of the virtuous woman from the virtuous mom that's raising up a king. But she, she also leads by example. Jump down to verse number 20. The Bible says, She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, she, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. So this woman who's real busy, she's got her own household, she's got all these other things she's doing, she's making the clothing, she's making the food, she's taking care of everyone in her house, but then she also finds the time to stretch out her hand to the poor and reach forth her hands to the needy and be able to help others even outside of her own house and all of the own responsibilities and duties that she has to be able to go above and beyond and help other people. And these qualities we need, and we ought to exalt the qualities of sticking up for the poor, sticking up for the needy. And, you know, there's a lot of, of social pressure by children and it starts young. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why I don't like sending kids off to public schools when they're just around who knows what type of people. I mean, I know just from the school that, that I went to, there's a lot of social pressure on even doing the right thing. And a lot of times doing wicked and doing wrong is exalted and looks cool. And if you try to do what's right, you're getting mocked and ridiculed and laughed at as a kid. And, you know, kids don't need that type of pressure. To be, to be pressured into not doing what's right and to think that's somehow not cool or whatever because kids don't have the strength that adults have. And even some adults don't have the strength, right? But let alone the kids. Unfortunately, they're, you know, they're, they're very impressionable and oftentimes good kids will just end up not doing anything. But we need to be raising our kids to do what's right even when it's not popular and what I mean by that, you know what I'm talking about. You know, the kids that just get picked on because so in, in many, even going back to my school, I thought of kids, some of the kids that got picked on, they were just poor. So they had some problems socially because they were literally just really poor. So they didn't have any of the clothes. A lot of their clothes might have been ripped or tattered or whatever going to school. That's not their fault. But you know what? They got made fun of quite a bit. And then anyone who might try to actually stick up for those people, they got made fun of too. 
And that's not right. I mean, you know, there's, look, when I, when I talk about the, the homos getting picked on, whatever, right? Like, I'm not worried about that. Amen. The kids grow up with that, fine. But things like being poor, or being needy, you know, just being in these situations, you need to, we need to teach our children to be able to, to do what's right and to stick up for those people and to encourage them and strengthen them to do what's right. And um, obviously, the, 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 you'll never be able to just completely shelter them from everything going on in the world, but we're preparing them for the world, right? So before they have to face that pressure when they're real young, we want to build up their character and build up that integrity and teach them so that when that time does come, whenever they face that, they'll be able to handle that and, and deal with those things. Just like King Lemuel is being taught from a child, these, this, these teachings of great wisdom and strength of character uh, so that when he is in that position, he won't buckle, he won't fold by these wicked pressures. Look at, let's go back to Psalm 72. So let's just get to get the context again. Verse 13, he shall spare the poor and needy and shall save the souls of the needy. Verse 14, he shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence. There's a lot of deceit, trickery, and violence against the poor and needy. And pre precious shall their blood be in his sight. And he shall live, and to him shall be given of the gold of Sheba. Prayer also shall be made for him continually, and daily shall he be praised. And at the end of the day, you know, when, and, and this is also foreshadowing a time to come, but people really do love when justice is served and there's proper judgment for the little guy. And that is something that culturally I think is still a good value that people would have if there was ever anyone to even bring forth that characteristic. And there are a lot of people out there that just, you'd love to have that story and see that story. You know, the U.S., the United States, was much more beloved and, and lifted up and looked upon as a beacon of light in this world not even that long ago. I mean, 75, 80 years ago, I mean, people would look to the U.S. not with the disdain that they have today. Now, by and large, Americans are perceived as ignorant, stupid, lazy, you know, uh, covetous, just all these different things, just really negative view from the world, and our leaders aren't helping us out any in that matter either, right? But there's a reason for that. And the more wicked our nation has become, the less respect people are going to have for us. There was a day, and look, our country's never been perfect, ever. It's never been perfect. No, no one, I don't know anyone that would ever make a claim like that. But the values that were promoted in the past were much better than the values of today. And, and people would look to these great values and give that honor and give that respect to the point to where, hey, prayer is going to be made continually for the people who are bringing good. You see a world leader, you see someone doing good somewhere in the world, that's just like standing for righteousness, standing for truth, willing to help the little guy be, you know, the, protecting the rights of the individual and of the small and the people who, who don't have anyone to speak for them. People will be praying for that person, that God will bless that person and help that person to continue to do the work that they're doing. And that's a fact. And, and you know, you may not be a king, right, of, of in this world or, or ever attain to some some political influence, who cares? But you still need to possessing the same traits because people see that in other people and you can become a leader without having to be a king, right? You can be a leader that's worthy of people praying for you and strengthening you and helping you and God blessing you and, and being able to stick up for other people with these, with these values and characteristics and I think it's a great thing to be able to have someone that's daily going to be praised. Of course, Jesus Christ daily is going to be praised, right? He is the ideal. He's going to be the, the embodiment of this verse just completely that 
prayer is going to be made for him continually and daily shall he be praised, right? But the, the closer we could get to embody those values and principles, people will do similar things, the same thing uh, for those as well. Let's keep reading here, verse number 16. There shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun. And men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. And again, this is the foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. You can get close to that as you follow Christ. And the closer you follow Christ, the, the, the more uh, you can have, as, especially as a king, as a ruler like King Solomon, nations can be calling him blessed and looking up to him, but nobody so much, uh, much so as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 18, blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things. And blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. And, you know, this just reminds me of the famous passage of Philippians chapter 2, Sorry, in verse number nine. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What a day that will be when Christ, when my Savior I shall see, or as the song goes, but when Jesus Christ is sitting on the throne and all nations are going to go unto him, and will be ruling and reigning with him in this life. So, you know, study this practice to be a king. You may be a king yet one day. But the Bible calls believers kings and priests, and, you know, we're of the royal seed. So just by, by virtue of being in Christ. But, you know, start living that life now, instill these characteristics in the children and, and, you know, one day you'll be able to put them to you. Obviously, every day you should be putting them to use. But uh, you may find yourself actually in one of these positions. If God deems you to be uh, appropriate for that and blesses you and rewards you with being over many cities because of the work that you've done here and putting his word into practice. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for this passage. We thank you for these great truths. I pray that you would please just um, bless us all here. Help us to have the courage to do what's right. And um, Lord, help us as we reach the poor and needy with the gospel, which is the most important thing, dear Lord, that we could uh, help them to get, to, to get saved by leading them to you. And I pray that you would please just um, help us to get our minds right and not be corrupted by this, uh, this wicked world that we live in and the wicked philosophies of the world, but that we would have the courage to stand up and um, just do what's right according to what your word says. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.